What happened? The most fair man in Baltimore, man. Montana. Tap in. Like, comment, subscribe. It's late night. Squeeze. We just doing it. I'm on a mission. We just doing stuff. I ain't gonna lie. What happened? says the city streets are safer for this. Montana Malik Baronet. Like the video. It was this 21-year-old police say shot and killed Alfonso Williams on this part of West Lafayette Street two years ago. But they say it would be just one life he snuffed out in a neighborhood he suffocated in fear. Baronet is an absolute poster child for what a repeat offender is in Baltimore City. We are certain he has been involved in numerous acts of violence to include multiple shootings and multiple murders. The city of Baltimore has built a reputation for itself as one of the most dangerous places in America. Underneath the hard hitting football and cold weather, Baltimore has a dark underbelly ruled by vicious drug organizations. Baltimore, Ben Dusty, right? If you ain't from around the US or not, you don't know. Baltimore, Ben Dusty. <laughs> Baltimore been crazy. Yeah, it's like that. Baltimore been a crazy little little city, man. Wow. That terrorized the city and boosts the crime rate. Definitely the subject of today's video was like Marlo Stanfield from The Wire in real life. He was the leader of one of the most violent drug operations in Baltimore and was killing people left and right hey. with a smile on his. Hey. Tap in, follow the Patreon. We reacting to the wire right now. So Baltimore, if you're from Baltimore, you see this. Tap into the Patreon. Wherever you from, tap, tap into the in. Patreon. We'll see we'll I'm on season four. About to be season oh, five. Marlo's teeing up right now too. I ain't gonna lie. Marlo's a demon. I like Marlo. Space. He was rumored to have been involved in up to 19 murders. Man, I know y'all saying I seen the wire when I was young, so now it's like a. Grown man, so it's hit different now. Rewind. You gotta re rewatch sometimes. Was convicted of six of them. In fact, the police named him the city's number one trigger puller. The subject of today's video is not other than Montana Baronet, and today we're gonna be telling his story. But before we get into the video, please be sure to like and subscribe. Montana Baronet also known by the nickname Tana, was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 1995. He grew up in an area of Baltimore called Sandtown, Winchester. Sandtown, Winchester is one of the roughest areas in the whole city. According to BaltimoreCity.gov, over 50% of families there are living below the poverty line and over 86% of children there were born to single parent households. Growing up, Montana pretty much had to fend for himself. His father was a Jamaican immigrant and got deported when Montana was just four years old. His mother was always out. Yeah, that's right there. That right there calls everything. No pops. Pops bad man. Deported, you're done, nigga. In the streets and was rumored to be a drug addict. Baltimore is a city full of drug dealers. And in an area like Sandtown, Winchester, those are the only people making real money. Naturally, a young boy without guidance like Montana would look up to them and aspire to be just like them. When he was around 7-8 to eight years old, Montana and his brother named Terrell Sievels would get involved in the drug trade and start doing favors for drug dealers. Eventually, when they were young teenagers, a member of the Black Gorilla family named Davon Robinson recruited them to run one of his drug operations in Sandtown. Over time, Montana and his brother would go on to start their own crew called TTG, standing for Train to Go. The TTG crew grew to over 300 members and they were making over $50,000 a week selling 300 members. That's never good to have a gang and that much niggas. 300? That's too much. You got 300 niggas in your gang gang? You got about possibly to some snitches <laughs> drugs and doing murder for hire despite the money he was making Montana wanted to be respected and feared by those around him this would lead to him becoming more and more violent and he would soon grow into a cold blooded murderer on May 3rd 2014 Montana would kill for the first time on this day two sisters mean 
On May 3rd, 2014, Montana was May 3rd, 2014. Would kill for the first time. On this day, two sisters were hanging out outside of their home in Sandtown when Montana walked up to them and made crude comments about them. He basically told them that he wanted to smash both of them and he told one of them that their thighs were exposed and that she needed to cover up. The women were offended, so they chirped back at him. Montana then responded, telling them that he does what he wants. The girl's brother, named Alfonso Williams, was nearby and he joined in to defend them. He told Montana, yo, you don't talk to my sisters like that. That's not the way you talk to them. They're not hood rats. Montana responded and said, my bad, and that he was just playing. Alfonso then attempted to make peace by shaking his hand and inviting him to come over later that night to watch a fight. Al what? Yeah, just gonna pull up and watch this fight with me later, man. It's alright. Disrespect my sister. It's cool. We good now. You can watch a fight. Dickhead. Hold on. Shaking his hand and inviting him to come over later that night to watch a fight. Hours went by and it was now nighttime. Alfonso walked out of his house to wait for the pizza delivery to get there, while well, Montana pulled up carrying a gun and shot him nine times. Alfonso was shot in the chest, arms, and neck, and was transported to the hospital. Yeah, someone's, someone's a psycho. <laughs> that wasn't his first one. He clipped him for that. That was not his first body, nigga. He got the story wrong. Yeah, he's been doing this. If he clipped a nigga for that... That ain't gonna be your first kill. You ain't telling me that. I've been in the streets my whole life. That's a, that's a but nigga, you gonna kill it? Y'all shook hands and he walked away and they're like, "Yo, come over." You was niggas a psycho. Well, he's a psycho. He's a psycho, bro. You gonna go kill a nigga on your first homie for that? Never. Well, that ain't his first one. He been diluting shit. But well, I, he was tragically pronounced dead. It's the first one on record. <laughs> At just twenty three years ain't no old. Nigga doing that. This would only be the beginning of Montana's killing spree. That was made to Montana was close friends with a rapper named YGG Tay. One of Tay's other friends, a man named Terrell Hellrell Jarrett, made the mistake of misplacing a substantial amount of the rapper's money. When Tay confronted him about it, Hellrell proceeded to slap him. Following this incident, Tay would put thousands on Hellrell's head and Montana would allegedly collect it. On June 29th, 2014, Hellrell was playing dice on a sidewalk in the 1300 block of Ward Street when a gunman strode up to him and opened fire, striking him in the chest and stomach. Hellrell was taken to the hospital where he was tragically pronounced dead at just 21 years old. Montana is believed to have been the gunman in this incident and the one that got paid. Unfortunately, the killing would have stopped there. James Blake, Lil Ronald. And Ronald. Four, Four months Tua. later, two other local He called two of them. Langley. Four months later, two other local gangbangers, James Blake and Rodon Langley, were killed. Their mistake had been trying to kidnap Milk real named Roger Taylor, who worked closely with a major drug importer named Shango Owens and was financing YGG Tay's career. The kidnappers grabbed the wrong person. They kidnapped a guy named Scratch, real named Darius Singleton, who was Tay's friend and had borrowed Melk's car. After realizing they had the wrong guy, Blake and Langley stripped Scratch, took his money, and let him go. When word reached Melk and YGG Tay, a bounty was offered. Both Blake and Langley were shot dead. James Blake was just 24 years old and niggas was dropping that bread on niggas heads. And look at this nigga. Of course, this is what the news do right here, y'all. Both look. Blake and Langley were shot dead. James put up this nice ass picture of this nigga like he a good Samir, like he a good civilian. And he just kidnapped a nigga. But they're gonna post this picture up. This little freaky ass selfie right here. Like he a good yeah, job interview yeah. selfie. Yeah, I got a job interview today, head ass boy. Let me chill because he passed away. Nigga, stop looting him. I don't want to keep wilding. I don't want to be wilding. My fault, matter of fact. Let me chill. My bad. But I hate when the news do shit like this. Post motherfuckers up like they just innocent. And, and niggas out here tweaking. Post a nigga's tweet picture. Yeah, that's like a job interview picture. He had an interview that day. He's about to go get a job.
James Blake was just 24 years old and Ronald Langley was just 22 years old. Montana and another TGG member named Binky, who were named John Harrison, were named by witnesses and on social media as the likely trigger men. Langley was set on fire afterwards. His blackened remains were discovered in November behind a West Baltimore Elementary School. The killing would continue. On January 4th, 2015, Montana and Binky were driving down the 1100 block of North Woodier Street when they spotted a BGF member named BZ, renamed Brian Chase. Montana and Binky had been looking for BZ because he told someone that there was money on Binky's head. This enraged members of TTG and made them want to kill him. When they spotted BZ, Binky hopped out of the car and shot him multiple times. After being hit, BZ started to crawl away towards a fenced yard when Montana and Binky pursued him and finished him off. BZ was shot a total of 14 times, who would later be discovered by the police and transported to the hospital where he was tragically pronounced dead at just 32 years old. Montana and other members of TTG would follow this incident with a horrific broad daylight triple homicide. Jail Thompson, Jack Queen, Parker, Randy. In June of 2015, an attempt on Montana's life was made. One day, he was riding a dirt bike in the streets when bullets flew by him. Fortunately for him, none of them struck him. Montana believed that a BGF member named Dirty, real name Lamont Randall, had sent the shooter to try to kill him. He would proceed to gather up a crew of TTG shooters to go and kill Lamont. On July 7, 2015, they found him. On this day, Montana and his TTG crew pulled up in two vans in the 900 block of West Fayette Street and spotted Lamont in a crowd of people. One shooter hopped out of each van and shot into the crowd trying to hit Lamont. Lamont was shot 17 times, but three other innocent people were hit in the crossfire. A woman named Jacqueline Parker was shot 11 times, and a man named Gerald Thompson was shot 19 times. A fourth victim named Ashley Johnson was shot as well. Lamont, Jacqueline, and Gerald would all tragically be pronounced dead. Lamont was just 39 years old, Jacqueline was just 53 years old, and Gerald was just 34 years old. Ashley survived her injuries. Montana was believed to have been paid $10,000 for being one of the gunmen in this murder. Before finally getting caught, Montana would be linked to one more murder. Montana and TTG were even willing to kill members of their own crew if they felt they had been crossed. A TTG member named Thug, written in Antonio Addison, had been associated with a man named Andrew Yo. Johnson. TTG believed that Andrew was cooperating with law enforcement, so they wanted to kill Antonio just for associating with him. On May 25, 2016, Montana and TTG members found Antonio in front of his grandmother's house in the 1200 block of North Cary Street when they shot him multiple times. He was taken to a hospital where he was tragically pronounced dead at just 22 years old. Montana had been quoted by an informant as having laughed about the murder and saying that Antonio deserved it. Montana had consistently been named by witnesses as the gunman in murders, but the police could never get enough evidence to charge him. Eventually, this would change and Montana would finally be brought to justice. Montana was officially arrested on August 19th, 2016 while coming out of a movie theater. He was 21 years old at the time of his arrest. He was charged with the murder of Alfonso Williams and the police were trying to find enough evidence to charge him with over a dozen more. In the official announcement of his arrest, the police called him the city's number one trigger puller. In early 2017, Montana would be released from jail by accident due to a mistake by the employees. While he was in jail, the feds decided to pick up his case. Due to the feds picking up his case, his state charges were dropped. The employees working at the jail didn't realize the federal indictment was in place, so they just let him go, seeing that he no longer had state charges. Rather than flee the country, Montana went to a Gervonta Davis fight in Brooklyn and posted a picture of himself at it on Instagram. The police were able to track him down the next day and rearrest him. 
the employees at the jail were suspended afterwards. Montana was suspected of many murders, but the police were able to gather enough evidence to officially convict him of the murders of Brian Chase, Marquez Jones, Lamont Randall, Gerald Thompson, Jacqueline Parker, and Antonio Addison. Montana wasn't the gunman in the March 2015 murder of Marquez Jones like he was in all the others, but he was charged for being the getaway driver. Montana was ultimately sentenced to life in prison. Once again, this lifestyle just feels so pointless. You create a drug empire and make all this money, but you kill so many people and destroy so many lives in the process that you can't live peacefully. All of the work that you put in is rewarded with a cold prison cell for the rest of time. Let me know what you guys think about the situation in the comment section. And please be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.